let's go ahead and get, get started with just a quick introduction <clears throat> for everybody. Um, Robert started his career in newspapers and uh, that's part of the reason why we brought him in is because he, he did a little bit of everything at newspapers and then after a while of, of seeing what possibilities were out there, he, he uh, quit quit newspapers and went and worked as a an assistant for Gregory Heisler. Was it Heisler, right? Yeah, uh, Greg Heisler, Walter Yost. Yeah. I worked yeah. with Mary Ellen, the littlest Mary Ellen Mark, just a littlest bit, Joe McNally. So. Yeah. And all this was to, to become a better visual storyteller. And since then, he's had over 50 stories for, well, the last one was your 50th story for <laughs> National Geographic. Um, if you're a Friday Night Lights fan, he's, he's the photographer that shot that originally. Um, he's a good guy and he uh, is fun to work with. So I'm turning the time over to Robert. Hi guys. Um, I don't know, I guess uh, I appreciate being asked to do this. I, uh, I you know, as, as Jay said, um, I, I've done a lot of different kinds of work and I, I think in 19, August, you'll remember, 1991, uh, uh, I was kind of done with working at newspapers. I started at Kansas State University, got an internship at the Philadelphia Inquirer, um, stayed there until I went and did pictures for the book Friday Night Lights. Um, and then I, that was nice because that ended up being 17 pictures in black and white in Sports Illustrated. So it really got me interested in working for magazines and naively, I guess, or uh, just trying to, trying to figure out what I wanted to do, I, I, I thought I could work for magazines. Um, but I ended up working in Cincinnati at the Cincinnati Post and then Ogden, which is where I met uh, the guys who asked me to do this today um, at the Ogden Standard Examiner. And then I... Uh, sold everything, got on a bus and moved to New York. So I've been in New York for 27 years, I think now. So um, it's, it's, uh, it's worked out okay. Um, and, uh, you know, you can't ever really um, know what meeting people is gonna do for your career. I mean, just a chance meeting with Buzz Bissinger at the Philadelphia Inquirer led to Friday Night Lights, which is something that has informed and changed my career for, you know, a million times over. First there was a book, then there was a movie and the TV show, and it, it just has become um, iconic. Uh, and and the photography had, had a lot to do, I think, with the visual um, representation of how successful the movie was. and and the TV series and, and that. And, and actually, in about a month, I have a book coming out with the University of Texas, which goes back into the 30, the pictures I shot 30 years ago and uh, is publishing like 80 new pictures that have never been uh, published before. So, um, but I, I don't know, I guess for me, I wanted to, I've, I've kind of been become, and. The Friday Night Lights is very bare bones, reportage, black and white photography. Very similar to the, the kind of photography I did um, when I uh, started in newspapers when I was about 16 years old. Um, and then, but I've become kind of known for my lighting. And the reason I moved to New York, um, it was so I could learn lighting and learn how to apply lighting because I wanted a career in this business no matter what. So it was, that was very much the focus. And you know, it, it's come to the point of not just learning to lie, but learning to recognize good light, whether it's manufactured light or whether it's available light. Um, you know, this picture is um, available light. It's a, you know, one of my favorite pictures and it's really one of the first, you know, quote unquote, good pictures or pictures that I liked that I shot. Um, and it was a good story too, because I got out there the day, I went out there the day before and the light, I just had missed it. So I talked the photo editor into letting me go out the next day. And then this is the, the result, which was, you know, I'm, I'm very happy with the picture and, and the way it turned out. Um, 
And it kind of, it changed something in my head about available light. And, you know, working at Geographic in the early days, we were shooting slide film, which is super complicated, just more difficult to shoot, certainly than digital, and certainly than uh, and black and white and chrome as well, so, or black and white and color negative as well. Um, but I've also learned to do a lot of macro photography and uh, working for, you know, all the photographers I've, I've worked with, it was a matter of, of kind of putting your hands on the materials and, and making a lot of mistakes with strobes and not really seeing the light. So, um, you know, I, and this is available light. This has got like three different lights on it and it's an ant and amber, it's, or it's a wasp and amber. It's about the size of my fingernail. Um, so, um, I, I think that really understanding light is the key, uh, for me, whether it's available light or strobe light, and there's new kinds of lights that people are shooting with that are, um, that are, um, not hot lights, but LED lights that, uh, really help. And since you're shooting video a lot of the times, I think that that's one of the key things that younger photographers can do is to try to learn um, how to use, you know, uh, whatever light it takes, whether it's strobe or constant source or available light. So this is something I shot for the New York Times Magazine, you know, and I just like the, the daylight aspect of it. So I, I shot it uh, available light. This, this picture has like 14 strobe packs on it. Um, and it's the Natural History Museum in New York and uh, it was a story I did for the National Geographic on taxidermy. And this is kind of one of the considered the best taxidermy ever done. So, you know, you're working with museums shooting behind the scenes and convincing them to let you come in there with like five assistants at night. And we had like eight hours to shoot this. So it was a lot of work to get this done. Ended up running uh, four pages in the Geographic uh, double gatefold. So, you know, uh, the, the story was something that I pitched as well. Um, a lot of times people ask me about working for National Geographic and they, they say, um, oh, I'd love to work for the magazine. And my first reply to that is that, you know, do you read the magazine? And, and most people don't read the magazine. So if you're going to work for somebody, you really, I really stress that you learn to, you read the magazine and learn to understand the way they tell stories. Um, it's a very good time for younger photographers who are doing sound, video, um, all sorts of uh, the technical aspects of things and people who are connected to social media. It's a good time um, for, for younger photographers there. Um, I think that they're doing a lot more, there's a lot more equity at Geographic now in terms of uh, assignments for women and, and minorities and, and things. And I think that it's a really positive um, move by, by the magazine and by the society in general. So um, this was a picture I shot of a, for a story on the human heart. Um, and this is, this is, again, this is something I researched. I found this is a heart that's had the fat stripped away from it and was in a, a museum in Philadelphia. This is a story that has a really big, uh, dust spot on. Um, but this is a story I did about biofuels and a lot of the success I've had at Geographic is to learn to use available light in the field. Um, this is uh, in Poland at a, a rapeseed oil field where they harvest the, the, um, the crop for oil. Um, so it's an alternative to uh, petroleum. Um, the, the thing that I've I think I've been successful at. Um, this is a, a donkey embryo and I was shooting something in the West Bank for Geographic and I saw this in a in a museum and uh, you know I think necessity being the mother of invention I used the strobes that I had but I also had no black background so I took my shirt off and used it as a black background. I, I tend to travel with you know, eight or 10 cases of equipment, but I went on this one my, on myself because I couldn't get a visa for anybody to go help me. So, and again, this is in a museum. This wasn't the assignment, but I saw it. I liked the, 
the situation or like the artifact, I shot it and then it is run in, um, you know, geographic in German Geo and other places. So I think you have to keep your mind open to not only shoot the assignment that you're given, but to keep your eyes open and see what else just interests you. Because I think the reason geographic hires me or has hired me so much is that I can, I can think on my own and they aren't just hiring you for the pictures you've shot. They're hiring you for the way you tend to think about, uh, uh, think about assignments. So, um, this is something I shot for geographic. It's a tiny little tooth. And this, this also goes to the aspect of keeping flexible geographic, the photo editor didn't know if they wanted it on white, gray, or black, so I shot it on everything. So um, this is another story I did on um, eugenics. It's the where people thought that the intelligence of people is judged by the size of their skulls. So this was again in a, a museum in Philadelphia. Um, and and it's it's up to you, the photographer. It's it's ultimately, um, I don't know what everybody's legal situations are, but the copyright is yours, the picture is yours. And I think it's up to you to be happy or sad with the way a picture comes out. And it's also, it's up to you to, um, to decide how it looks. I mean, a lot of times I'll get in a situation like this and I'll try to figure out the composition of it and then I'll just move the light around and see where the light hits. Cause it's not like, you don't light anything the same. I, I, I light some portraits and things the same, but like given situations, everything's flexible. Everything's in play. So, okay. Put so one thing I would say, Robert, you mentioned that you talked about the legality, you know, whether owning your own copyright makes it yours. I, I would say most of us work in, and work for higher situations, but, right. but, you know, those photographs are still ours. They'll forever be connected to, yeah to who we are and what we did. And, and because of that ownership, we should, uh, you know, give it all, give it all we can. Oh yeah. I mean, look, your, your name is your bond. You know, your name is, is what, um, what determines, you know, whether you get hired again. I mean, your work and people associate everything you do with them. I've had people come up and think about my pictures because they saw something 20 years ago or people saw something just the other day. Um, I got, I did about three or four assignments uh, for the New York Times uh, about a year ago, uh, kind of right in a row. And it, it came from my Instagram. It came from definitely from that because of the, the type of um, assignment I was given. So um, let me see. So you're saying do this what? Just drop it in here? Yeah. Or yeah. you can go on the left menu and just click on the folder in that desktop. See, I've... I've uh, Oh, so I can just go like this. Yep. Double click. Yeah, and if you, oh, if you click, yeah, there you go. All right, there and then you double go. click on the photo and it will load them up. Now, All before right. you get started on this, we have a couple of questions that have come in. Do you want me to give yeah. those to you now or? Yeah, I'd love to hear whatever people are thinking. All right, so let's look at uh, first one. Um, what professional photographers have influenced your work and how do you incorporate their te techniques into your photography? Well, you know, it, it's, it's interesting. Um, I, I love Greg Heisler's work and it was very, it was very much strobe forward. So um, I, I tended to just kind of gravitate towards his work and I really wanted to work with him once I got to New York and I had the opportunity to, it was kind of a chance meeting um, with a, a photographer at the Salt Palace, <laughs> which is so long ago in Salt Lake, it's where the jazz used to play. And uh, I met a lighting tech and a photographer there and we just started talking and I had just done Friday Night Lights. It had just been published. And he said, wow, I told him I loved Greg Keisler's work. And he said, well, I used to work for Greg. So he goes, he gave me a phone number. He said, call Wendy, tell Wendy. I said that, you know, that Welch says you have to hire this guy. And it, it just worked out. It was kind of a remarkable um, uh, luck. So you never know, like I say, where the really small meetings are going to take you in your life. So, um, all right. Got another question here for you. Uh, how, how is the reaction in general when you ask permission uh, or access, et cetera, when you said you're on assignment for Nat, Ge Nat 
natural well, geographic. Well, let's be honest, it's pretty good. <laughs> I mean, mo most people are like, you know, they're, most people are really happy to be thought of in that terms. I've worked in a lot of museums and I work with a lot of scientists and the scientists are generally thrilled to, to be asked. And a lot of them actually are grantees for the society. So they actually have a, a, a research grant or something like that that they're working on, so. But in general, people are pretty thrilled to, to have you there. And, uh, mm -hmm. you know, I don't, I don't necessarily, I mean, some of what I do is photojournalism, but a lot of what I do, um, I, would, I call uh, documentary. So I'm, I'm um, you know, I'm, I'm documenting things for scientists and that's not like I'm just slinking around with the camera. You know, I learn about the story. I talk to the scientists, I, I go into the field and you'll see, I mean, some of the pictures that I uh, shoot are very deliberate and they're very deliberately lit. So this is an interesting story that I did. It's a, a story about uh, bog bodies, um, which are these, Iron Age II bodies that are found in North, uh, Northern Europe that have been thrown into the bogs and they absorb the tannins of the bog and they become um, black basically. And, but they're really interesting because the preservation is amazing. Um, when they found some of these, they did fingerprints on them because they thought that they may be a modern day murder. So, um, and you'll see. Um, this is called the Tolan Man and he has a noose around his neck and. I was allowed into the museum and I, I just, you know, I was in there overnight for a few days shooting um, kind of an exhibit of these. And it was really fun. I was doing this initial story on, on Chrome uh, slide film. And it was, you know, for me, it was like my third or fourth story for the magazine. So I was very, it was, it was complicated and hard to do. And these objects are black and they're shiny. Um, and I'll show you, um, this story didn't get published and I was, I was crushed. I, I felt like I'd failed, but it really didn't have that much to do with me. There's other reasons it didn't get run. And then 10 years later, I pitched it again, so I gotta go again. But these are pictures from the original um, story and they were shot on chromes. You know, I'm not handling the color temperature very well. Uh, they're, they're kind of all over the place, not very good. Um, kind of interesting, um, uh, you know, mummies. They're essentially mummies because they have skin on them. But, uh, um, you know, um, this wasn't a very successful thing, even though uh, that's not the reason it didn't run. Um, this is a peat digger. Um, you can see the peat in the foreground, and they, they, they still in Ireland use this for heat in rural areas. And this is the kind of environment that, uh, that the bog bodies uh, are found in. And that's the Tolan man, his entire body. Um, and again, you know, I was using gels and doing some things that were very 1990s kind of photography. So it was um, aesthetically, it was kind of, it was good for the moment, but it, it, it kind of transcended that. I mean, photography styles change, so. So while you're while we're looking at some of this lighting, uh, Kristen Grace, who uh, she she works in uh, with the Natural History History Museum, she says, "How do you deal with the stone reflection and glass? Um, so many of my subjects are preserved in jars." Yeah, yeah. Well, you know, it depends. But no matter what, I I, I tend to build like a black tent around myself, and you know, if you can get right up next to the glass as well. It's, if things are in jars, if they, you know, look, the, the institutions you work for or, you know, if you're at a university and they have um, a natural history museum, uh, you can figure out a story to go do there and do a story on um, uh, what, let me see, you know, stone tools or something like that. Um, then they want good pictures of these things and you just have to develop um, a relationship with people. I've got a good relationship with the American Museum of Natural History in New York because I've, I've photographed there like 30 times now, 40 times, and I know the PR people and everything has to go through the PR people. And so it's, it's, um, it's a complicated thing to develop this relationship. But if you're 
work for a university and there's a museum at the university, I think you just have to go talk to them and you can go talk to them without cameras around your neck. You can just go talk to them as a, as a journalist, as a person and say, this is what I'm interested in doing. And if, uh, when I first started, I would show people uh, at museums examples of work that I liked and that's kind of what I was going for. And some of the times it wasn't my work, it was other people's work. So um, I don't think there's any problem with mimicking people's work or being inspired by people's work. Um, you know, Miles Davis said when he was talking about uh, creativity said that we all learn the same notes in the same scale and then it's how we arrange it that that matters so I think that photography is about light and capturing light every subject's been photographed before so it's just a matter of jumping in um, and uh, figuring out how you want your pictures to look and ultimately the pictures you think are successful, you'll keep shooting pictures that relate to those things. You'll find your own voice. And um, I recommend that pretty much any, anybody who comes and talks to me, um, younger photographers, that they learn all the programs and everything they can, um, all the technical programs, like I should learn photo mechanic, obviously. Um, but, uh, uh, I recommend they go to a, a bookstore, a good bookstore or a library and look through the photography collection there and really spend time looking at it and keep the pile of the ones you like and then either check them out, purchase them or just re-look through them because that'll help inform how you want your pictures to look in the future. So, um, let me see. Okay, so escape and then uh, let me see, fog two. So this is, this is how I handled it the next time around. So just journalistically, it was smarter. This is a bog where some of the things were shot and I spent the time um, looking around. This is a uh, medium format uh, slide film. Um, you know, so obviously already it has like a, an improved technical aspect to it um, and handling, handling the chrome the way it should be. Um, the artifacts are shot more interesting. So again, this is from 2,500 years ago, um, Iron Age II time frame, and like everything that goes into the bog gets surrounded um, by the material and is really perfectly preserved, as you can see. Um, that's a peat shovel and a, a hat, uh, a bonnet that somebody lost. Um, this is what happens to um, wood that is in the in the bog. It's called bog oak, and uh, it gets beautifully preserved and. You know, I wouldn't have thought to shoot a picture like this the first time I did the story, but then, you know, I just researched it in a lot more intense way and figured out anything that applied to that time period that I was interested in. So I think that, you know, we all get assignments. People go, oh, shoot this. And that happens to me uh, in the work I've done for Geographic. People say, shoot this. But the great thing is that I'm given the flexibility to do my own research and kind of add things to it and throw things in. I think of the work I've done for Geographic out of the 50, I think like 15 of 15 or 20 have been my own ideas, but every single one, it was an assignment where they say, hey, there was times where they said, hey, go shoot this. And I go, okay, but I talk to the scientists or I do my own research and I'd shoot something else. And about 80% of the time, I'd come back with something different than they expected. And that is the thing that was published. So um, this is another landscape where, the, uh, where one of the most famous bodies was found, the Tolan man, the one with the noose around his neck. And so this is a nice landscape for what it was, but I lit the tree. So I tend to use um, a lot of lighting outside, as I mentioned. And in terms of lighting, the way I look at it is there's two kinds of light. There's hard light and soft light, and it's either you know, diffuse lighting through a soft box or like a raw head. So um, if you think about like a point source of light, like a raw head, the sun is a point source. And then when it's cloudy like this, that's a soft box. And it's really about how you make the two relate to each other in your images. And, um, uh, you know, 
you want the picture to be dominated by soft light and just have an edge to it? Or do you want it to be dominated by, um, you know, hard light and have that have its own quality to it? So I think you need to, to look at that. As you can see, like in this picture, there's a lot of, uh, I reshot this from the first one and there's a lot of um, black fabric I traveled with for this. But I also, I shot all these separately, but uh, these are the, the other bits of the bog bodies that I didn't shoot, you know, the first time I got the assignment and just kind of flushed the story out and made it more interesting as far as information. And it went from being like an eight page story proposal. I think it was 22 pages in the magazine and it was in their top five stories for the year. Um, again, I would shoot stuff on black and white and gray sometimes just to give uh, a, it helps in layout and it helps in the design of what you're shooting. So this is actual hair from a bog body. That's how perfectly preserved uh, these things are. So the, the knot, it's called a Schwabian knot. It's a warrior's knot. So it was actually um, uh, tied in that fashion when they found it. So it's pretty amazing. Um, you know, there's footprints from the time period they find in certain levels of the, of the bog material. So that's me out in the wind and rain of, of the, uh, the bog, bog in Ireland. Um, and when I'm talking about lighting things in different ways, I put a few of these in here um, that are, uh, you know, that's really essentially one primary light um, kind of scraping across the body. And then, you know, this is, this is the thing. There's another light over here and it's, it's too strong. I mean, I prefer this a little bit. This is too strong. Um, so somewhere in the middle is probably the best place. I also um, will make a decision how to crop something, but then I get you know, two, three, four, 10 frames of that, whatever. And then I just keep moving around and shooting different objects and, and aspects um, of, of whatever I'm photographing. So um, <clears throat> using, I used to use like five, six lights on things and I'm using fewer and fewer lights now because I actually know how to use them uh, um, better. So, um, you know, I think really if I was to do it over again and give anybody advice, I think that you need to just um, use one light, two lights, bounce reflectors and just see where that goes. Because sometimes you get overcomplicated and you start using a bunch of lights. You don't know which light is making it look good, which light is making it look bad. So I tend to build with one light. So I get my composition set, I get one light on it, and then I decide. Um, the cinematographer said to me, they said, uh, don't worry about where you put the light, worry about where you put the shadow, um, which actually, for some reason, made just a lot of sense to me. And um, it's helpful because a lot of times you can kick a shadow into a part of the picture that doesn't matter or it isn't part of the composition or, um, or the, the story narrative. So. Yeah, so I, you know, there's something like this. I'm sure I shot like 500 pictures of this one <clears throat> bog body and I would come in and, you know, do details and um, different, different portraits. You know, I kind of approached these guys with, with the respect I think it deserved and treating them like they were a portrait. Again, just a different aspect of shooting uh, the environment to kind of make it show up. So if you remember the first one that was very blue, this is a much more successful um, attempt at the second time. And, and there's, no, there's no shame in having to do something over or, um, uh, you know, I remember a story uh, that Eddie Adams was a famous photographer and he had a workshop upstate in New York. And um, <clears throat> there was a story that he shot Anwar Sadat for the cover of Parade Magazine you know, and he shot him this portrait, nice lit, and then Sadat leaves and goes away, and then there was no film in the camera. <laughs> so it happens to the, to the best. And uh, so he came back the next week and they did the same exact thing over. And, and you know, there's, there's no shame in coming back. You know, we all make mistakes. So um, I used to be really hard on myself if I didn't, if something didn't go well. And I don't think there's much advantage in that. Um, you know, so you get stuck on, on that. 
then you're not going to focus on the important thing. You have to like acknowledge a mistake and then let it go and move on. Try to learn from it. And <clears throat> I didn't shoot this angle a uh, lot the time before because I was just scared to talk to the museum curator and say this is what I want to do and and uh, they let me do it. And it's a much more interesting picture than even than that. Um, which is a nice picture, I think, but then this is much more interesting and it, it shows the noose and it just gives more context to, um, to the toll in man's life. I mean, this, this angle has been shot by 1600 photographers and been published a million times, but I've never seen a photo that was shot like this. And since I've shot this, I've seen, you know, 30 different photographers have the same view. So it's always nice to kind of do something first, so. So Robert, can you talk to us a little bit about uh, the relationships you build um, with the editors? Um, uh, this comes from Gabriel Mayberry. How do you gain the relationship with an editor to where you can have such, so much flexibility, um, like going in a day later or, or submitting additional images, et cetera? And, and I would add to that, the, you know, talk about the relationship you build with like the, the museum curator or the people you have to deal with in, this, in the field. Yeah, you know, it's interesting. Um, nothing succeeds like success, right? So if you do a, I mean, I've, I've, uh, I've worked in 60 museums probably it seems. And, you know, I'm, I'm pretty good about um, making sure I follow up if something runs and looks nice. I, I let them use the pictures or if they have a scientific journal, I let them use the pictures. So, you know, you know, sometimes there's photographers who don't leave very good impressions and they, you know, I think, I think that tends to be basically about insecurity. You know, um, I think uh, you can be a good photographer and a nice person. And uh, I don't think a lot of times they are. Um, and uh, I think that, like I say, nothing succeeds like success. I, there's a photo editor, Kurt Mutchler, who's a senior um, managing editor for photography at Geographic. Um, and he's a science, uh, his stories are all science-based. So we are actually talking this morning about a story um, that I'm gonna do some research on and try to try to find. And it's interesting because it's COVID, so we were trying to do it so everything's drivable. So we were trying to set some parameters on it that, you know, because I can drive a lot. I can drive to Denver if it, from Brooklyn if I have to, if there's something I wanna shoot. But, uh, you know, Kurt and I have worked on 20 stories together and we've had some very good successes with stories. So I think that a lot of times when there was a story that was a problem uh, at the magazine or the photo editor couldn't figure out what to do, they'd, they'd say, well, let's see what Rob thinks and see if he can do it. And that's a real, I've considered that a compliment um, to me and I, I, I really appreciate that kind of faith. Um, you know, I worked for Greg Heisler, really not for very long, but he was a very big influence on me um, because I would go on a, sh a shoot with him. You know, there's two or three assistants and then I'd see him do something and it's like, wow, that's kind of the way I thought it would be done. So you just kind of get yourself reinforced sometimes because um, you have to learn to trust yourself because trusting yourself is super important. And, um, you know, uh, you have to you have to own your mistakes and then celebrate your own successes. So. Um, and, you know, I started doing a lot of work for the magazine. Greg said to me, he said, be careful that your pictures don't look just like theirs, you know, because Geographic had the, the historical aspect of things being um, um, sunset silhouette, kind of this beautiful view of the, the world. I, I actually think the magazine is, is a better magazine now in some ways than it has been. It's more it's more topical and it's more connected to, to real life. I mean, they're doing stories about COVID, which is a pretty quick turnaround from the magazine. Um, they did a story on gender. Um, they've done stories on a lot of subjects that people, um, people wouldn't have thought had a geographic focus. Um, you know, a lot of people did their careers were spent doing stories like Russia. You know, it's like, well, that's, that's cool, but I don't understand. It's better to have a story because Russia is not really a story. It's, uh, it's
it's it's too big to do as a, as one thing. But um, you know, but getting back to what Greg said, uh, you know, he said make sure your pictures don't look like theirs. And I hadn't seen him in ten years or so. And you know, I talked to him, and he says, you know, you you've affected the magazine more than the magazine's affected you, which was for me was a good compliment. And I based a lot of my still life approach on a photographer named Pervyn Penn, who's you know. Um, you know, one of the most celebrated American photographers, and he did these beautiful still lifes for Vogue. He did beautiful portraits and fashion. So I urge anybody to pick up um, his book, Passage, and uh, uh, look at um, look at that work because it's it's brilliant and it's, it's super important. So, so Robert, that sort of leads into one of the other questions. One from Chris Lowe. Um, he asks, uh, "What is the number one thing that you want to say with your photography?" How long did it take you to find that? And is it cons constantly changing or more of a mission statement? So I'm assuming he's talking about your style, your, yeah. you know, what makes you unique as a photographer? You know, um, um, just one quick thing. is like, that's a picture of the actual bog, you know, the material that preserves these guys. And I wouldn't have thought to shoot that 10, you know, when I got the first assignment. So the more you learn, the more you grow. Um, hey, <laughs> my mission statement. I, I think, you know, about my 10th story in, I did a story on evolution on uh, Charles Darwin. And uh, it, it very much changed the way I wanted to do um, a story. Um, it was 52 pages. It was the uh, second to last issue that a long time editor had done and you know this is 2008 i think or 2000 2006 you know geographic we did a story on evolution and we had like six thousand people cancel their subscription <laughs> because you know there was this uh lack of belief in uh, the theory of uh, natural selection so um so that's kind of uh was interesting but he had a commitment to it it was a huge story I went to, I think, 17 locations in 12 different countries in um, three months. And uh, it was a very big success and won the National Magazine Award. So to do a story on evolution really kind of changed uh, the kind of work I wanted to do because as I was talking about Irving Penn, it was photographed in that style, a lot of things on white. So you can actually just look at an artifact and look at it for itself. So there's no environment that's confusing you. It is what it is. And that's amazing. So that was kind of um, one of the stories that I found the most successful. And I've, I've done, I don't know, 15 stories or so on evolutionary biology, that there's some uh, relationship to evolutionary biology. And, uh, you know, I did a book called Evolution of Visual Record that came out a few uh, two years ago by Fiden. And, um, you know, you can see a lot of that kind of work on my Instagram. Um, which is Robert Clark photo, but uh, you know I'm I'm interested in science, science photography, um, evolutionary biology, both in environment and not in environment. And I think right now specifically is a really really important time to not deny science because that's that's not getting us where we need to be. And uh, I just. Uh, I've got really strong opinions about uh, science and, and journalism and belief in science. So, um, but really I, I understand what the question is. And I think for me, you know, growing up, I just wanted to be good at something, really good at something. And whether I'm really good at this or not, I, it is something I strive for every time I pick a camera. Up. And I'm also, I think I have a, I'm a, what they call a lifelong learner. I want to, I want to learn something every day and just kind of move forward in the direction of, uh, of trying to learn uh, different things. So, um, so I, I think it's about curiosity. Um, for me, kind of the most important, I'm very tenacious. I work, um, I think work really hard when I'm on assignment. Um, so I've got tenacious and I'm curious. So it's, I think it's a pretty good combination. So um, that answers the question. 
like I said, that's bog. That's another one of these. Okay, so you know, also I'm I'm adjusting things sometimes in Photoshop. So um, it's not just a pure frame a lot of times. So okay, so we're gonna. So this is a video if it plays. I just thought everybody'd be interested. This is me shooting one photograph. Um, so I went through I think seventy two different frames. So it was you know, 72 different lighting changes. And essentially it was, uh, this is, you know, back when digital was first starting. So um, I had a long tether cable and the camera was sitting on top of a glass case, which kind of goes to the question that was asked earlier. Um, it was on a glass case. I dusted it off and I set it up there. It's on autofocus and I framed it up and I actually shot this from the computer. So, I didn't have to deal with reflections so much. Um, you know, the, the gray background was uh, the gray glass that was under the, the bog body. Um, so this is, just, this is just me making kind of creative decisions um, as, as I was going. So it's like adding one light at a time until I get it to the right way. I want it to look into the right ratio. Um, so, you know, and then, and then for me, when I get to a point where I'm satisfied, I tend to stop. Um, and then, because there's always something else to photograph. So I get it to where I have kind of a, I end up getting a kind of a physical, emotional response to it, kind of a feeling in the pit in my stomach. And then I just move on to, to the next thing. So I think that that's interesting for people to see just, you know, you know, essentially I made 71 mistakes until I got to where I wanted to be. So, um, if that's uh, if that's helpful, um, is let me see here. So this is a a story that I did uh, for Geographic on, you know I've done like fifteen stories in Peru. So there's a place in Peru where they had they found all these uh, child sacrifices, um, and you know they try to put the story together and try to understand it. But there's like three hundred bodies and. Um, bodies of llamas and all sorts of things. So um, these are between I don't know, 10 and 14 year old uh, kids. It's a pretty gruesome story, but uh, it's an interesting story. And I think it's a story to, that needs to be told because I think we need to understand our past. Um, and this, this on the left-hand side is a llama uh, and uh, a, a body of a child were buried together. I think they killed 300 llamas and um, uh, 196 children or something and um, you know archaeologists can tell it was all in a mud layer so it was kind of during a uh, global time period in Peru where there was a uh, El Nino happening so whether it was some kind of sacrifice to to figure out if it was uh, El Nino related it's a hypothesis nobody knows for sure but they did check the DNA on the bodies and the DNA of the local population and the DNA is different. So they checked up in the Andes and the people that were, um, uh, that were sacrificed were um, from another part of Peru. So whether it was warring tribes or factions, um, nobody really knows, but it's interesting to know that that was a, a case. Um, this is, uh, I kind of put this in there to show some of the lighting and compositional things that I go through. So, you know, this has one light on it. I'm working with some available light. Um, so the, the available light mixes into the harder light. Um, um, if you can see down here, that's a, a breastbone that was, you can see by that, that it was cut. Um, and that they were all, the reason they knew it was a one-time event is because and a sacrificial event is because they were all killed the exact same way. They were all um, cut through the, the breastbone. Um, so every body they found basically had the same injury to it. Um, and and in, in dealing with a story like that, there's also great landscapes to be had. So, you know, Geographic has this uh, history of doing beautiful landscapes. And, uh, you know, this is um, the largest sand dune in the world in the background there. Um, you know, people go uh, snow um, or uh, sand surfing on it, um, sand skiing on it, rather. 
So I needed to get a good picture of it because that was part of the sacrificial um, uh, narrative that was in the story. Uh, and I looked at it at sunrise and sunset. And this is sunrise and I went out and, you know, I was gonna put a, a light on that tree and I, I splashed it across the ground. And then I decided I didn't like it. <laughs> so, so I turned it off and just shot it as a silhouette. And then the one that I shot one frame. And then uh, the thing that ended up looking the best and running in the magazine was the original frame that I shot. So, <clears throat> you know, sometimes you just make choices and they're wrong and uh, you just gotta move forward. But this, this actually worked out because I wasn't stuck with an idea and I changed. So um, this is another, uh, yeah, I'm looking at my selection of pictures here and I've shot so much archeology span and so many uh, mummies and things. It's kind of, uh, kind of interesting. I should do a book on mummies. Um, it's called a trophy head, but they actually defeated their rivals and then they carried their heads around with them. So um, this is a different view of this, uh, of that landscape. So, you know, I shot it at different times of day from the ground, from the air. Um, and that's obviously, that's a, a function of how you have this ability at Geographic to do so many different um, things. And, you know, they have budgets. They had bigger budgets, but, but there's, you know, the possibility to go do things and uh, uh, really sink your teeth into it. So, but I urge anybody where they live, no matter where somebody lives, there's a good story to be told and you just have to to spend your time and energy because the first stories I did and things, I didn't get paid anything. You know, I just did it because I was obsessed with photography and trying to, to make my way in this business. So. Hey, Robert, can I jump in with a couple of questions? Sure. Yep. Uh, first one's from Brianna Scroggins. Uh, what is the most exciting surprise or the biggest or biggest appoint, disappointment and the one thing you wish you would have learned earlier in your career? Okay. The, the thing I would learn earlier in my career, even though I didn't have the experience, is to trust yourself. It's really to, to trust yourself and, and you know, you, uh, you don't have to ask anybody else to have a career, you know. Um, I worked with some people who uh, were a little, uh, not jealous, but a um, little, uh, I don't know, harsh about my success and, and things. Um, not that I'm all that successful, but um, yeah, I, I would say just learn to trust yourself. It's hard to do. It's a lot easier to make excuses than to trust yourself. And plus, if you trust yourself, it means you have to work hard. So uh, what was the other part of that question? So uh, what uh, it, was there one thing that was the most exciting surprise or the biggest disappointment that you? Well, biggest disappointment. Well, the, the, it's kind of nice every time. You, you know, I've had like 13 or 14 covers of the magazine domestically. So it's always nice when you, you get the magazine at your house. They send you advanced copies, but there's nothing like getting it in the mail and actually seeing it because that means everybody else has seen it. So it's a, it's a really nice um, thing. And, and not that I'm surprised by, uh, by the, the work I've done um, or in, and my success at Geographic. It's just really rewarding and, and fun to have done uh, all the different things I've, I've been able to do. So um, there, there aren't that many disappointments that I can think of. And I think really, I think of di disappointments as just a way to an opportunity to uh, an opportunity to learn as opposed to being, you know, oh, poor me, you know? So I, it's just not how I'm put together, I don't think. I think that op when you fail opportunities are, uh, okay, well, that didn't work, what's next? So, but uh, that's, that's how I tend to think of it. So, I mean, look, I've been to 80, I think 82 countries for uh, geographic. And um, before I moved to New York, I was 30 years old or 32 years old. And I, I had only been to Canada. So uh, Canada and Ireland, but so, you know, it's been a busy 
long time and I've traveled a lot and it's been phenomenal. So, um, I don't know. I don't think about it in those terms. I've, I've been very lucky, been very fortunate. The people I've worked with have been supportive. Very lucky that at the moment I got to geographic, they needed somebody who could do what I wanted to do. And they, they uh, had a need for it. And the, the magazine allowed me to grow. It allowed me to make mistakes on, you know, eight page assignments, 10 page assignments. And then those turned into 16 page assignments and then 22 and 24. So they allowed me to grow. Um, as you can see from the bog body work, I showed that the second time I shot it, it was just like a completely different, it was almost a different subject the way I approached it um, because I just improved. And I was able to kind of, you know, it was a good example for me to be able to do one assignment and then not get it published and then do the exact same assignment essentially later on and just see how I handled it. And for me, that was an eye opener that I had learned to handle something so well, uh, improve. So I've shot a lot of mummies and stuff. This is, um, these are called Chacha Poyan mummies. They're in the Peruvian Amazon. Um, so a uh, story goes that, uh, that uh, Edward Munch, the painter who did the screen, had seen one of these on tour in um, Paris or Copenhagen or wherever he was from and uh, painted the screen based on one of these. Don't know if it's true, but, um, but this, and this is a, a warrior and you can see that's a, that's a knife right there and a flint to sharpen the knife. So it's interesting that some of these things when they're uncovered, that's, that's how they, they find things. There's all sorts of significance and they knew he was a warrior because of the antlers and, and things. <clears throat> You know, I have thought about doing a book on mummies and I, I like these women at the Natural History Museum or at the, the Cairo Museum. So, um, <coughs> so that'll be part of my, my mummies book. And this is Peru. <coughs> Excuse me a sec. Peru has so many mummies and artifacts that these are just literally sitting there in the ground. Um, in this one area, there's thousands of them. So there's too many uh, for them to, to deal with and put in museums, just way too many. So, and again, and, and they, you'll find like um, trophy heads actually out in the, uh, in the wild. So in the landscape, and that's a, the landscape that we are working in there. So. So Robert, Jason, uh, um, or rather Jaron Wilkie is asking, what is your approach to telling these long-term or long-form stories and how do you make sure you cover all angles? Well, the first thing that happens when I get an assignment is I wonder how I'm going to mess it up. You know, that's, that's the very first um, thought for me. Um, you know, and then you get over it because you got a lot of work to do. So, um, like this is a good example. I did a story on the Inca. And uh, so we were up in Machu Picchu and up in the Andes and, and all over the place. And the Inca empire stretched from Ecuador down to Chile. So I just made this choice. I had so much material to cover and so much ground to cover that I just made choices along the way. So I wanted to show the physical boundary of, uh, of the empire. And then also they, they kind of absorbed different um, cultures and then they end up becoming um, uh, Inca. Um, so you just learn um, about the subject. I think the best thing for a story is to bury yourself in the, in the uh, subject matter. And then, then ideas start to come. <clears throat> I've done so many different stories on some of the same material that it's kind of a building block for me. You know, it's, it's like you build a pyramid, the wider the base, the higher the peak. And I, you know, every story I've done seems to relate to every other story I've done in a, in a way. So that's been, that's been very beneficial, I think, uh, the fact that I've done so many stories from the same type of material. Um, so it, it grows on that. So what was the second part of that that Jared asked? Jaron asked? Um, let's see, how do you make sure you cover all, the, all angles? you just bury yourself in the information and you just, you know, even something that doesn't seem that important can make a great picture. 
and you walk into the photo editor and you give them your pictures and then you can justify it. You can stand behind the images and the choices you made as a journalist. So you just bury yourself in the information. So that's, that's what I would say. So these, these mummies were actually interesting because I was in the Amazon at this really nice museum and the woman who was there got really sick and, um, you know, and I traveled three days, driving three days to get there, um, four days to get there. <clears throat> and I said, look, I need to shoot them. So she actually let me just move them around and arrange them the way I wanted. So it was, it was, uh, see, that's a pretty amazing opportunity that not many people are ever going to have. So, and uh, these are mummies. These are bodies inside these, uh, these bags. So, you know, and it's interesting, like something like this, I never would have thought of it, but it's, um, you know, um, it's in one museum and it's uh, so a lot of photo collectors have collected it. So you just never know what's going to make an interesting picture. <coughs> so this sort of brings up a couple of different <coughs> comments on the thread. Um, do you ever experience burnout or struggle, struggle with, with work-life balance? Um, and it also uh, says, you know, some of this stuff is sort of dark, you know, dealing with, uh, you know, child. Uh... Yeah, that, that was that was kind of awful because my my daughter's around that age. So it was kind of uh, creepy and you just I just have to push past it and kind of focus on on what I'm doing. Um, you know, it's it's just work life balance. That's a difficult one. For everybody. I mean, I think it's even more difficult being in uh, Brooklyn. Um, you know, if I was able to live or if I would had never left Utah, I probably, if I was successfully freelancing when I was in Utah, I never would have left Utah. I think it's beautiful and I love it there. But, uh, you know, I kind of had to come to the source where most magazines are put together. And, uh, you know, it's been really beneficial for my career to work in work out of New York because a lot of the stuff that I cover for geographic is fairly regional and a lot of the best museums are in this area. So, I mean, this is a, this is a picture from Tanzania uh, and it's the largest human footprint site. There's like 350, 400 foot footprints there. And they're actually, it's uh, the footprints are in hardened volcanic ash from the volcano in the background. So, um, you know, and it's like, you wanna make a kind of a good looking picture that's the lead to the article. So this ran, I think it's a little wider than this. It ran three pages as a fold out in the, in the magazine. So, you know, all these footprints essentially running away from the, the volcano, so. And this is one of the, the footprints and, you know, with the, the scientific measurements next to it. And you know, and you still get to shoot gorgeous landscapes. This is in uh, in uh, Argentina. Uh, you know, you still get to see these amazing landscapes other people don't get to see. And you know, but you just have to be prepared. I mean, this was uh, we'd been there for two weeks, and there was never sun. It was winter in Argentina. It was just overcast and gray and ugly. And then we got sunlight for about twenty minutes, if that. And uh, we were heading back to camp. So. I was with these scientists, I just stopped and I said, just keep walking. And they just walked through the frame and, you know, uh, made, a, made a nicer picture than, uh, than we'd had all day, uh, had all the time we were there for the landscape, so. You know, and there's, there's things like this. It, this was a, really an amazing thing because this was dug up while I was there. Um, and the, they had just found a little portion of the thumb and then they kept uncovering it and then to have the fabric in the hand like that it was just it was just really humanized you know the the artifact so it was just this material uh that was in the the hand of uh the uh the, the mummy hand so you know i think things like that when if you can find something like that that kind of gives it context to something people can relate to so that's always important and helpful <clears throat> You know, no, Robert. Is, yep. Sorry, uh, Kristen uh, from the that works in the Natural History Museum. She's asking another question about uh, 
she, well, she mentions that her researchers are reluctant to show images of human remains. What kind of special permissions did you or Nat, Nat Geo have to get, get, have to get for publishing the photos of, of human remains? Well, a lot of these people who are, I'm working with are on grants for National Geographic and they're given their, you know, they're given money to do the research. So we actually get access to all the, the stuff that they're, uh, we get access to the to the um, to the materials that they are working with, so there is that. I don't think there's any real problem with showing human remains personally. Um, you know, I think in war photography, you know, they've stopped showing people who were injured by in war situations, and I think that desensitizes us to the fact that war is awful, that war is difficult. I mean, it's, it's just my opinion on these things. And I, <clears throat> I certainly think that you're not gonna offend any family members because these are remains from long ago. Um, and I don't have any um, religious convictions that it's disruptive to the soul or to its dishonors their remains or anything like that. I think that anytime you can learn and knowledge is the key. So I think that any time you can learn and understand another culture, uh, either from the past or current, it adds to the conversation of being human. Uh, Nick is asking, uh, do you have any, any assignment that you didn't take, something you turned down? And if so, yes. why, and did you regret it? Yes, I did. I, I turned down an assignment uh, on Orlando. They just wanted to do a big piece on Orlando because it was changing so much because of Disneyland. And I just, I thought about it and I thought, this just sounds awful to me. <laughs> I mean, there's a chance to make some good pictures, but it just wasn't, I didn't think it was going to be that interesting. And uh, I turned it down and somebody who's a really great photographer did it and didn't, it was a very hard story. And, you know, I'm just glad I didn't do it. Um, I just... It just doesn't sound interesting to me, you know. I'd rather do a story on my hometown, Hayes, Kansas, than Orlando. I just don't think that, you know, strip malls and amusement parks. I mean, if you if you get into amusement park and have no, and have total access, that would be great. But Disney isn't going to do that, and Disney didn't do that. So maybe they would now because they own Geographic now. But you know, so that that's the one I turned down and was happy about. We went to a scene where there was like 600 um, of these skulls and body parts in Peru. And there's just too much for a, a poor country like Peru to deal with. So oops, there's a the bog again, see the escape. Um, give me some other questions. What else do, what else do you think? This one is, is a freelancing question coming from Jason Haley. Uh, working as a freelance photographer, specifically under COVID-19 uh, restrictions, do you have any financial tips, pricing budget, investing contracts, et cetera, that you can to consider? Um, Mary, well, <laughs> I mean, you know, look, it's, it, this is a really difficult time period. Um, and, and, you know, I was really, really lucky in my career that I worked at, at a time when I could get internships. You know, I had an internship in Jacksonville, Florida, Fort Worth, Texas, St. Petersburg, Texas, Philadelphia. And, and these were well-paying assignments. And, you know, I got to Philadelphia and, you know, I worked with Sarah Lean, who became the director of photography at Geographic. So I got to know her when I was like 22 years old. And Larry Price, who won two Pulitzers, and Tom Kennedy, who became the director of photography at Geographic and first hired me. So, you know, it was, it was like going to graduate school. It was better than going to graduate school. I was just working with some of the very best people in the world, and I was lucky. And I'm not sure how easy that is nowadays. You know, um, people call me and talk to me about internships and this and that. And that was before COVID. And, you know, I tell a lot of people who come talk to me, 
<clears throat> and who show me their pictures that <clears throat> they should do something else. And I, I, I do that to see what their commitment is, you know, because a few of the people who <clears throat> come back to me three, four, five times and keep showing me more work and showing the progress, they've succeeded. But uh, I, I, I think people have to, you have to be certain this is what you want to do. And I think, you know, there's been a lot of photojournalists who shoot weddings now, and it, that's fine, I think. I think you're covering an event and it's cool and you're shooting people that are joyful and, and there's real emotion there. And I think that if you can do beautiful pictures like that and, and help yourself survive, there's no, there, it's just, it's an awesome thing to do to keep your hand in, in the thing. But you also have to remember that it's, if this is not the kind of work you wanna do, that you have to put yourself in a position to do the work you want to do. And if you have to pursue it on your own um, or do it and not make any money on it, just do it because you want to do it, then you have to figure out a way to do that. Um, there's, there's a photographer I know who was, a um, he worked in an espresso bar and, you know, he did a lot of uh, pictures at night around the city and has done beautiful work. And, uh, you know, it was published in um, some big magazines and, um, you know, he found a way to make it work. And I think you have to do that. So, you know. So August, August asked the question, how do you approach photographing living people who are part of the story you're working on? And then he, he adds uh, things like lighting, lens choices, et cetera. Um, let me see here. Let's uh, speaking of people. Uh, it'll get there in a second. Um, uh, while no. you're, yeah. while you're getting, oh, no, go ahead. No, go, go ahead. Well, there was a critical question that'll take a second for you to answer. It's what was your favorite Aggieville bar to drink, to get a drink <laughs> while a student at K-State, Rusty's or Kites? It was Kites, no question. Rusty's wasn't there when I was there, but really the very best place was Annie Mae's, which is still there. So, um, and that's when I turned 21 and could drink liquor. But uh, as far as a beer bar, it was certainly uh, Kites. You know, it had been there so long that my parents had gone there and all my brothers and sisters had gone there. So um, that's funny. Somebody's at the Collegian, is that where the person works? That's Matt Stamey. Uh, which, where are you at, Matt? I'm in Gainesville, Florida. Oh, okay. All right. Did, did he work on the Collegian? Yeah, Collegian and RP. Okay. You know, that brings up a really good thing. Like I said, the internships were phenomenal, but um, when I worked, you know, I didn't pay much attention to schoolwork in college, but I, I did work every single day at the newspaper or the, uh, the um, yearbook. And it was an amazing laboratory for us to work in. I was there at a very lucky time that uh, John Sleazer was there and he was college photographer of the year. Uh, Andy Nelson was there, who's at the Eugene Register Guard. Jeff Taylor was there. I was there. It was just really competitive. Um, Alan Eystone, a really good photographer, was there. <clears throat> it was just really competitive. And um, uh, we pushed each other. Yeah, a, a guy named Bo Rader was there. And Craig Chandler, who works for the university up in Nebraska now. It was just um, really good really good environment to, to work in. We pushed each other. I think it was the fifth largest daily newspaper in the state of Kansas too. So we had some, some opportunity to get pictures in the Kansas City Star and Times and the Associated Press. So it was fun. So, so August um, asked about uh, uh, portraiture and portraiture is really, doing portraits is the main reason I moved to New York. I never really wanted to work for National Geographic. It just kind of evolved and um, then I got interested in it and more and more interested in it. Um, uh, you know, so this is a, this was when I shot that footprint picture with a volcano in the background. This is in Tanzania. And this is, uh, these are portraits of people who've had, uh, uh, who were going through a, a ceremony that takes them into the adulthood of the tribe. Uh, 
and they wear the same clothing and they paint their faces and they go through this process for about, um, I think four or five months. And I just thought the way they were dressed was amazing. So I chose a similar background and just shot them all the same way, available light with, uh, with a, I use Nikons now. I used Canons before I use Leicas still. Um, uh, Leica sponsors me for some of the stuff they, that I do. Um, uh, but I, I think this, I'm pretty certain this is with a 100 millimeter macro uh, Zeiss lens um, that's amazingly sharp, beautiful lens. It's the old style, so it doesn't actually register on a digital camera, but it does a beautiful capturing. You just kind of have to look at your histogram um, or your preview to figure out you're doing it right. But it's, you know, it's sharp as can be. It's a beautiful lens. Um, and, you know, photographing people, I did a story on allergies. So I photographed this little boy who had um, allergies and I just showed up at his house and turns out he had a bird walking around. So you just never know uh, when something might work out for you and make a good picture. But in terms of shooting people, I just try to be real straightforward and honest with them. Um, it depends on the situation. A lot of times I don't talk to them much. A lot of times I talk to them a lot. I couldn't talk to the kids in Tanzania. So, you know, that, that was just part of the dealing with that situation. Um, you know, I, I had done a book uh, because I had done Friday Night Lights. I spent a year off and on with the Houston Texans uh, pro football team. And I did a lot of portraits. This is on four by five. Um, so it's a little bit different than some of the work I normally do. Um, and it was really the last big story I did on film. I think this was 2008 or so. Um, you know, but that's a soft box. And I built a, a studio. That's a, a, a big soft box or Octobank probably. And uh, uh, might be a beauty dish, I'm not sure. There's all sorts of light modifying devices and I can never really remember what I shoot stuff with. <clears throat> if something's not working, I just move on to something else. I think it, pro it probably has a ring light fill on it, a really, really, really low ring light fill and then a, uh, a bounce card in the background. So, or off behind the helmet, I should say. And you know, the, the thing I'm trying to do in lighting is I'm trying to make you look at what I want you to look at. I'm trying to make you look at what I think is important. Because I, what I think is important is, it's more important than the writer, <laughs> I think. Because, you know, I don't tell the writer to write, how to write their story. Um, you know, a lot of writers have incorporated my situations into their text. And I've taken a lot of information from writers and made a better picture from it. So I think it's a really collaborative process. and and. Working at Geographic, I've been very, very good about being collaborative. You know, I'm in another country and I'm sending cell phone pictures back to photo editors and, and you know, trying to get them excited about the story. Also, they start showing other people. So it kind of builds this energy within um, the story because it's always a fight for real estate. You know, how big is your story going to be? This is a guy who planted all the trees that you see in the background. He <clears throat> helped, uh, it's in Brazil, he helped uh, get, uh, um, you know, help rebuild this forest. Oh, there he is again. You know, one thing I've, I've liked to do is um, I was shooting a story on looting for Geographic, and each one of these is individually shot in the same box. And then I just put it together as a grid because I think there's this sense of repetition that I think really makes something interesting. You know, and I'm also, these are, each picture is like a 50 meg file, so I'm gonna make a huge print of this. Um, and uh, we're in this area shooting, and I wanted to shoot one more that I forgot to shoot, so we went back the next day and they said, wait, you weren't supposed to be shooting yesterday, and this is in Cambodia. <clears throat> so it's like, oh, okay. So, you know, there's times that, that like the head guy was gone and we just went ahead and shot. Each one of these heads was confiscated at the Thai-Cambodian border and it was being smuggled out 
um, it was being looted to try to sell to collectors around the world. Um, you know, I think we talked about this and I, I know Jay and, <clears throat> and August, you guys know some of the technical aspect of, of strobes um, and, and there's something called flash duration. So if you want to freeze something in midair or freeze it the fastest it can be frozen, you know, you have the lowest power setting. So it's an issue of making relationships. At first, when I started shooting, I thought, well, you'll just use as much strobe as possible. And it, it, it doesn't work. Um, there's uh, something called the Pythagorean theorem of light, and which I tried to understand and don't really understand. Um, I get the concept. But uh, you just have to experiment with lighting. You have to figure out what you want your picture to look like. So I went and shot this. It's for a human performance story. Um, and uh, you know, I shot on a really slow shutter speed, um, and I got this nice blurriness that was good, but it didn't really make me, didn't get the story to, to pay attention to. It didn't make me want to pay attention to the picture. So, you know, and I shot some good stuff, and I sent it to the photo editor, and I said, oh, I'm just going to come home. And there, there was one day in Dallas, and he goes, no, 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 go back tomorrow and really work at it. So I went back, and there's this railing in the background. There had been a railing in the foreground. So I convinced them that it was okay to take that railing off. And, you know, we kind of adjusted the situation to where, um, you know, to where it was a better picture. And, you know, I was very insistent on just getting the runner. So the picture was originally cropped right there. And then the last 10 or 15 frames, I shot it as a wider picture. And it's a much better picture. I, you know, I don't know what I was thinking, but it's a science photo, so you're including, including the laboratory aspect of it as well. So, you know, you make a lot of mistakes and you have to be really flexible when you show up at a situation. If you have a, a confirmed idea of what the picture is gonna be, it's okay, go ahead and shoot that, but then shoot something else. And this is in a cave in Africa and just using the, it's where they found <clears throat> some of the earliest human remains. So it's called Rising Star. And it's just got this amazing environment of uh, the lights, amazing. And, you know, shooting people. I was in Peru and I just <clears throat> see somebody I want to photograph and I just go over and talk to them and see if they'll let me photograph them. I mean, I love this picture of uh, this uh, group of women and children that were waiting for uh, a festival to, to start in, uh, in Peru. And that, I can't speak to them. I don't speak um, uh, Quechua, which is the language of the, the um, Inca, uh, essentially. And so, you know, you just shoot pictures. And sometimes you shoot pictures to the point where they stop paying attention to you. <clears throat> and I just, I just like the fact that nobody's paying attention to me except for this lady right there. So. So Robert, we're getting close to the end of the 90 minutes that you had originally agreed to. I just wanted to be respectful of your time. And Well, I'm, I'm uh, going to talk sure about you. some other things if people are interested. Um, this is one thing I, I thought I wanted to mention, though, certainly for people who work at, at um, universities. You know, there's a lot of research done at universities. So this was in a, this was in a cave uh, in Canada, and it's a, <clears throat> they're studying, uh, uh, dark matter so you're 100 you're about a mile down in this cave <clears throat> where they have these uh, instruments for studying that but um, you know so you work a situation you shoot it you try to make it interesting and then this is a neutrino detector and and you know that picture was published but then this picture was also published which is something you just wouldn't think of um, you know so there's different versions of that but this guy is holding a picture of that. I mean, this is in a laboratory, a lot of situations we've all shot where it's really difficult to make a good picture, you know? And then this guy studies dark matter. So, you know, essentially I was sent there to shoot this picture, but then I figured out other pictures to photograph and they were all published. So, um, uh, just real quick, when you're talking about portraits of people, this is like a, this is available light, daylight. And these were guys that worked on an archaeological dig in Egypt. And it's this one tribe of people that have worked on all the archaeological digs. Um, so I'm actually pitching a story about that tribe to 
the magazine. So some amazing faces. So anyway, um, <clears throat> is there anything else you guys want to ask about or talk about? I think we've uh, gone through all the questions. Well, thanks. It's been nice to, to talk to you. So, um, but uh, I appreciate it. And, and thanks. Uh, thanks. If you have any other uh, questions, if anybody really has any questions, they can email me. Um, I'm happy to, to look at pictures and talk to people about things. Um, so that's Robert at robertclark.com. Well, thanks, Robert. I really appreciate that. Um, yeah, no worries. Appreciate your work and, and spending the time. Well, people have been really generous uh, real helping quick, just, me out. Uh, thanks, Robert. Well, I wanted to make a quick announcement for uh, the winners of uh, the book that uh, Robert's given out. Uh, Brianna Scroggins, or Scoggins and uh, Chris Lowe are our winners. So, and thank, thanks again for being willing to share, uh, share those books with us. Oh, it's my pleasure. Well, thanks for joining us, everybody. Uh, um, keep, uh, stay tuned to the Facebook page, and we'll let you know in the future who, uh, who else is coming in to, to 